Well, friends, regardless of how you have voted this week, you have to admit it's been a really hard week and a really challenging year. Almost every analyst is calling this the most divisive election campaign in history. Throughout our country, there are millions of people today who are uncertain, scared, and hurting. And there are millions of people today who would have been feeling those exact same feelings if the outcome of the election had been different. Sadly, this election was never going to bring an end to the deep divisions that have been sown in our country, in our world. But no matter who you voted for or whether you were rejoicing in the results or mourning the results, I think we can all agree that our country is deeply wounded and there is hurt on all sides. The thing that's been hardest for me has been the way I've seen people treat one another. From television newscasts and Facebook posts to conversations around coffee pots, I've heard people on all sides taking shots at others, making statements that were condescending, or making a joke that put someone down who believed differently. It's been painful for everyone. I vividly remember years ago traveling to Israel and standing on the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem where scripture tells us that Jesus stood and wept over Jerusalem. And as we stood there that day and we looked out at a city that's divided into quadrants where you aren't even allowed to go into certain portions of the city because of differences of how you believe. Where my elbow was bumped by machine guns being carried by 16 and 17 year olds who probably didn't even know what they were doing. Where three world of, uh, religions fight, fight over which physical site belongs to them. We all stood silently because we were overwhelmed with grief. Deeply saddened by what we saw. And I remember thinking that day that Jesus must still weep over Jerusalem. Well, the past few weeks, I keep thinking about that day. And I thought about how much Jesus must be weeping over our country. Because the elections have exposed an America of deep differences of opinion over race, ethnicity, and culture. I read one Christian author, pastor, and consultant who said, neither unity nor division simply come from politicians. Politicians reveal and amplify what is already there. Had there been no division or bigotry in our hearts, there would have been very little in the election. That's a tough pill to swallow. But we know we're a splintered country and we are deeply wounded people who have been acting out of frustration and woundedness, and that is discouraging. But being people of faith, we have a responsibility to move forward. Ultimately, our faith does not belong to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or the Libertarian Party or, frankly, to any government or any uh, political party. Our faith is built upon the rock that is Christ's love and justice. And that is what guides us as disciples. God is the only one who can heal our hearts. And we, the people of faith, are to proclaim that. Our identity as Christians is found most clearly when we gather around the sacraments of table and baptism. In baptism, we hear an affirmation that every single person who is baptized is a beloved child of God. Every single one. When we gather around the communion table, we hold fast to the promise that all people are welcome to find nourishment and hope. These sacraments remind us that barriers of race, gender, status, and age are to be transcended, and barriers of nationality, history, and practice are to be overcome. Those words actually come from the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church. So I want to read it again. The sacraments of our church remind us that barriers of race, gender, status, and age are to be transcended. And pra uh, barriers of nationality, history, and practice are to be overcome. We are united as one in Jesus Christ when we celebrate these sacraments. And when we celebrate the sacraments, we celebrate that Christ is right here in our midst. 
Now, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to participate in God's breaking down those barriers. Jesus said as he began his public ministry that he came to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord. Now, why was that such an important mission for him to proclaim when he first came on the scene? Because the country of Israel was a deeply divided nation. There were all kinds of disenfranchised people. People who were pushed aside for reasons of race, physical challenges or illnesses, socioeconomic status or heritage. Seems as things never change, do they? Israel was a country that had fought and fought and fought. They had demanded a king and then they found that their answer was not through a political king. They had good kings and they had bad kings. They split into two nations and then each nation was taken off into captivity. They were a discouraged people. So it seems appropriate that our lectionary reading today has us look at a passage speaking to a discouraged people. When we meet up with Isaiah today, the long Babylon, uh, exile in Babylon has ended and the people have returned to their homes in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. However, they've returned to ravaged communities, vacated homes. Everything must be rebuilt. To people beaten down by years of oppression, God speaks a fresh new word. Be glad and rejoice. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating. It's hard to believe when you're standing in the midst of rubble. But Isaiah gives the people a glimpse of God's dream for the world. The wounds they have suffered, the hypocrisy they have encountered, the violence they have witnessed will no longer feed their cynicism. God is doing something new. But Isaiah has a little bit of trouble really painting this picture or explaining the vision because words are just not up to the task. He can only speak poetically. So he says the wolf and the lamb will romp in the fields together. Now we all think that's really cute. And we love to put on, you know, Christmas cards. The wolf and the lamb will lie down together. But think about that. Can you imagine the wolf's confusion at that first inkling of an urge to have table fellowship with that lamb upwind from him, without the lamb being the main course for dinner? What would the wolf's mother think? And what would they possibly eat for dinner tonight now? And what about that lamb? She's been taught from her elders from day one to stay far away from the big bad wolf and to run like the wind with that first whiff of his presence. What would her flock say to her if she ever knew that that strange desire had bubbled up in her to invite the wolf over to play, to romp in the grass? It's disruptive, is it not? Yet the image proclaims the good news of God's power to transform even our most imagined ways of being and thinking. New relationships are created and old wounds are healed. When you despair about the divisions in our society, these words help us look beyond the present to a time when the value of God's kingdom begin to take root in our world. Now, it's easy for us to think that's not going to happen until Jesus Christ comes again. But Jesus told us over and over and over that the kingdom of God is breaking in here and now. We get discouraged, though, because we think our actions aren't going to make any difference. So it's easy to sit passively on the sidelines complaining about how horrible it is that whatever has happened, waiting without much confidence for God to do something, some miraculous, big, awesome miracle that will change everything. But Isaiah's image, vision, makes it very clear that the mending of this world is not simply a divine construction project. Yes, God plays the crucial role in rebuilding, but God doesn't do it alone. In Isaiah's vision, the people and God will work together. Remember he said that in this new Jerusalem, they shall build houses and inhabit them and plant vineyards and eat them. 
He didn't say, I, God, am going to build houses. He said, they, they will build, they will plant, they will eat. William Sloan Coffin says it beautifully when he said, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. I'd like to add to that, expand it. Uh, Without God, we cannot. Without us, God's plan of redemption is not complete. For God chooses us and gives us the privilege of being part of it in partnership with God. Isaiah's prophecy encourages us and challenges us to work to make the divine vision a reality. It won't be easy. There will be obstacles and others working against it. But we're inspired by the vision and strengthened by the promise that God will be working with us. In her book, Stitches, Anne Lamont shares a story of a sparrow lying in the street with its legs sticking straight up in the air, sweating under its little feathery wings. And a war horse walks up to this little sparrow and says, What on earth are you doing? The sparrow replies, I heard the sky was falling and I wanted to help. The horse laughs his great, big, loud, sneering horse laugh and says, Do you think you're going to hold back the sky with those scrawny little legs? The sparrow answers, One does what one can. One does what one can, never knowing the impact it will make. Alex was an interrogator at the detention center in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The detainees she she worked with were murderers and rapists, and she never forgot for a single moment that if one of those people escaped, given the chance, they would kill you. Some had committed crimes so horrific that she lost sleep, wondering what would happen if one of them happened to get free. But that was not the only reason she couldn't sleep. She had spent 18 months in Iraq, before Cuba, first as a soldier, then as a civilian contractor. But she wanted to make a difference in Guantanamo, but she couldn't sleep. She was plagued with dreams of explosions and screaming. And after being sleepless for more than 48 hours, she began to hallucinate. And then she started thinking, wondering about all those detainees. And were they having the same kind of nightmares that she was having? Were they hearing bombs explode? Were they looking at the faces of people they had killed, thinking, what did I just do? Were they hallucinating? She wondered how many of them were still screaming at night like she was. Now, her job was to to obtain information that would help keep U.S. soldiers safe, and she did an excellent job at that. But what she would do with her clients, which she called, not detainees, she called them clients, She would meet and play dominoes and bring them chocolate. There was one detainee whose name was Mustafa who joked that she was his favorite interrogator in the whole world and she joked that he was her favorite terrorist in the whole world. He had committed murders and things that he wished he could take back. One day he turned very serious and said, you know everything about me and it is ugly and I've done horrific things and yet you don't hate me. Why? And she said his question stopped her cold. She said, you know, everything has, everyone has done things in their past that they're not proud of, some worse than others, but everyone has done things. I know I have, but I also know that God still expects me to love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. That means you. He started crying, and he said, that's what my God says also. She later wrote, accepting Mustafa helped me accept myself again, and my year with him helped me to heal, and my nightmares stopped. How do we heal our nation? How do we move forward? I think it goes back to Jesus' words of the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor's as ourself. And Jesus asked, who was your neighbor? For the people he told the story to is the person they despised the most. 
Carrie Newhoff um, is a pastor and author I recently heard at a conference on discipleship. Some of you were there with me. And he wrote a blog after this election saying, you know, I know that people are concerned, but this is a wonderful opportunity for the church to show the world what the love of Christ looks like. He believes passionately that healing and unity begin with us, people of faith. He wrote on Wednesday afternoon, Check your kitchen table. Think back to your last five gatherings. Do they consist mostly of people who look and sound just like you? We humans are famous for surrounding ourselves with people who look, sound, and believe exactly like we do. But what if you built three genuine relationships with people who are different than you in this coming year? Someone of a different color, a different socioeconomic status, a different belief system, a different marital status, a different sexual orientation. Now, before you think that's scandalous, just know it puts you in great company because isn't that what Jesus did? As we begin to love one another, to love our neighbor, those who are different from ourselves, maybe we can begin to experience God's dream for humanity. From the opening pages of Scripture, we were told that God has always been the light in this darkness. And as the Scriptures continued, we discovered that He is the hope to the hopeless and the peace to the restless. And then Jesus tells us that we are to be the light of the world. Friends, let us find our strength in God. And let us accept the same challenge he gave the Israelites to rebuild Jerusalem. Let us be the light in the darkness. Let us be the hope for those who are feeling hopeless. hopeless. May we be the peace for those who are feeling restless. God is doing a new thing through you and me. May we be his partners in transforming this world. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we look around, there is so woundedness, much woundedness around us. Not just from an election, but from hurts and words and injustices that have happened for ages. From frustrations, from blaming others instead of looking inside ourselves. From life being overwhelmed. We are a people who are weary and we are hurt. But God, we know that you are doing a new thing in our midst every single day. And we ask that we get to be part of the new thing you are building right here starting today in this place and this time. Give us a vision of what it means to truly be the light to the world. May we make a commitment to reach out to people who are different than us. May others look at us and see that we are different And that it is love that always wins. May love truly transform this world as we become to be your people. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.